We're going to get started today by taking a look at how we can study cells. Uh, hard to advance medical and regular scientific research if we don't have a way to analyze them, to look at them, right? But before we can start looking at the specialized equipment, uh, let's do a really quick history lesson. So how, how did the earliest biologists uh, look at cells, individual tiny, teeny, tiny little cells? Uh, well, first you have to have something that can magnify, right? Cells are not visible with, with just your eye. You have to have really good magnification. So we actually have this, uh, he, he wasn't a scientist. He was a textiles um, trader shopkeeper, uh, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, our grandfather of microscopy, and he got very, very good at grinding uh, glass lenses. And he was able to make some so good that he could see microscopic organisms. Uh, and he drew pictures of them, recorded them. He looked at water samples. He looked at sperm samples. Um, and and this, this leads to a paradigm shift. Uh, before he saw his animacules, uh, we, we didn't know, right? Everything was based in superstition. There, there was no cell theory. People didn't know what caused diseases, right? Um, so it takes a little while for that to all be formalized, um, but eventually by the uh, 19th century, we have this, this formalized, um, unified cell theory, which states that all living organisms are composed of one or more cells. The cell is the basic unit of structure and organization in all organisms, and cells arise from pre-existing cells through cell division. Um, there are some prominent scientists over the 16th, 17th, 1800s that participated in the formation of this cell theory. Uh, and I, I want to reiterate at this moment that remember that in the sciences, we use theory to mean backed up by lots and lots of evidence. Um, cell theory is... You know, it's coming up on 200 years old and there's been no evidence collected that refutes it. So remember, theory in the sciences means almost the same as law. So, all right, so let's talk about how we study these things today, right? Um, it's broadly, right, we can categorize cells as prokaryotic or eukaryotic. We've talked about that a little bit already. Remember that eukaryotic cells, those are going to be our more complex cells, um, typically. That's animals, plants, fungi, a huge range of different protists. Um, again, they tend to be more complex. This is where we're going to see multicellular life um, versus prokaryotic cells, right? There are not um, multicellular prokaryotic cells. They lack a nucleus. They don't have membrane-bound organelles. Uh, that's going to be bacteria, archaea. So uh, even, even the most complex and large eukaryotic cells, they're, they're not really visible with the naked eye. Um, there are a few that you can kind of make out an outline of, um, or if they're moving, you can kind of see their movement from the um, way they move the fluid around them, but you can't visualize them well. So you really have to have a microscope. Um, Lots of different types of microscopes available that can magnify from just a little bit of magnification to thousands, tens of thousands of times magnification. Um, so microscopes, they magnify the image um, and the images taken with a microscope are called micrographs. First up is light microscopy. This is the most common type of microscopy that uh, you're probably gonna come across. This uses visible light to magnify and visualize samples. Uh, it's suitable for observing live specimens as well as uh, fixed stained cells. Um, a dissecting scope is going to be best for looking at uh, like three-dimensional objects uh, or three-dimensional specimens, so like a, like a full tissue um, piece as opposed to like a thin section of tissue. Um, they require less preparation to view samples in the dissecting scope compared to a compound light microscope. Um, in that compound light microscope, um, you could have uh, free living like individual cells like protists or bacteria um, and you can leave them live on the on the slide if they're big enough you can see them um, oftentimes we need to add some kind of contrast or dye so that you can visualize them well because cells uh, especially little single cells or single layers of tissue they aren't they don't have a lot of color to them on their own they're very very thin and, and quite transparent 
um, unless we're looking at plant cells, which often have um, you know, green pigment in them, right? Or sometimes they have some other pigments as well. So we have to have them thin enough to pass that light through for the compound scope. Uh, and usually we need, like I said, some kind of contrast or dye so you can distinguish the different structures. Um, compound light microscopes can magnify something from about 40 times to 1,000 times. Um, so you can get uh, you can get a pretty good uh, zoom in on, on some very small things. You can see things like the nucleus, and if you have good stain, you know, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria. Um, as kind of a frame of reference, you can fit about 250 of your red blood cells um, on the tip of a pin, which you could then put right. You could put it onto a slide and view. Um, if you wanted to view them on the pen, you would need to use the dissecting scope, but you could do it. You can even stick your own, like your hand under a dissecting scope and look at the details of your, uh, of your skin or your nails, which is kind of interesting to do. All right. Now, electron microscopy, it's a very specialized type of microscopy, and it doesn't use visible light. It uses a beam of electrons in order to visualize your sample. Uh, this cannot be done on live cells. If you pass a beam of high energy electrons through a live cell, it's, it's going to die and probably burst apart if you haven't prepared it properly. Uh, so in this case, uh, cells, right, they're, they're fixed. That means that they've been killed um, and then you stain them with metal. So with light microscopy, there are a whole bunch of different types of stain, including specialized uh, fluorescent stains. But for electron microscopy, we're gonna need to use metal. And the metal is going to interact with the beam of electrons. It will reflect the electrons back and uh, allow you to see, uh, uh, see your image. So the um, image B on this slide is an example of a scanning electron microscopy image. Uh, where it has that kind of three-dimensional look to it. The sample is coated with metal and then the electron beams bounce off of it and that's how you create this image. All right, that kicks off our journey into the cell. Up next, we're gonna look more closely at prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So I will see you in our next video.